This debate we're working towards basically a democratic agenda. That is to say, we want to win the 2024 presidential election, but we also care about the things such as upcoming midterms, local elections, the future of the party, and the future of America in general. And in order to ensure the electability of the Democrats into the future, we think that Joe Biden ought to step down and allow Kamala Harris to take, to take his place as president of America. He would ideally step down, for example, between the 22 midterms and the 2024 election cycle to give us some time basically to be president and then to go on and win the election. What I'm going to explain in this speech is a couple of things. First, there's going to be the various reasons why Kamala Harris is A, very electable, but particularly when she's had the opportunity to be president first, will be very electable. That means the Democrats will win the next election, which is good, but also why in terms of the long-term health of the Democratic Party and of America in general, we ought to have Kamala Harris as President Joe Biden ought to step down. Okay, let's talk about electability. First thing that I want to say here is that Joe Biden can't run again. The basic reason is he's quite old, he wants to go home, hang out with his dog and his family. And the reason why that's important is because it's a very high risk thing to have someone get sick while they are in the, in the process of getting towards an election or while they are themselves the president. That's because you run the risk that at the last moment you have to swap someone in and you lose all of the momentum that you've been building up across that period. But it's also because there are very few things in America which are less popular than someone who is, le who is perceived not to be able to carry out their duty. For example, the time when Donald Trump had the lowest, his lowest ever approval rankings was literally just when he got COVID. Similarly, when Hillary Clinton got pneumonia on the campaign trail, in 2016, that was when she was at her lowest. That's just apparently, oh, yeah. you know, if you don't think someone can do the job, you're unwilling to elect them. So, we want the optimally electable person to be in charge of the Democratic Party going forward. And we think that if we give Kamala Harris the opportunity to be the president, she is going to be extremely electable for a number of reasons. The first of those is that she gets a significant incumbency bonus. How does that work? When you get to be the president, you get a few things. 
Firstly, you just get name recognition on the basis that you are the president. Secondly, you're in the news all the time. Again, you're just like doing policies, you're doing press conferences, yeah. you're flying around in Air Force One, looking cool all the time, so you get to be on the news. And the third, so you get to basically control like the talking points, control the agenda of the election. But the last thing is that you actually get to do policies, right? Kamala Harris gets the opportunity to pass things that Americans like, to like provide experience and demonstrate on her CV that she is a, a strong and capable uh, you know, caretaker of America. And actually, like, if you look at the things that Joe Biden's basically done so far, a lot of what he's done is just set up a really good team. So we think that, like Kamala Harris can just kind of keep that ball, ball rolling. For example, there's a lot of work that's being done in the middle a Department of Education in the States at the moment about debt, um, debt reform and those sorts of things at universities, which is probably going to be coming up 2023, 2024 is the time when they're going to be possible. We would let Kamala Harris do that. Those are some easy wins that we think Joe Biden can tee up for her to kick over the post. So at the end of all of this, we think that Kamala Harris is firstly going to very, very easily win the Democratic nomination without basically any fight. In the history of the United States of America, no sitting president has ever subsequently lost the nomination for their party because of the reasons that I've described that make them very strong. But on top of that, the party itself looks very strong and united in a number of ways. People like to vote for parties that look strong and united and aren't in fighting with each other and aren't fighting over who the leadership should be because they like look like a group that can work together, right? But secondly also, because you don't talk bad about each other, you don't create bad press about the other, the other people within your party, and you have united messaging all the way through. I'm hearing a lot of yeses, so I think we're going to get a big gotcha, like, neat intro, but we'll wait for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I want to say here is this is especially important because Republicans are divided between, like, they continue on with the Trumpian thing or go to, like, some Larry Hogan types who are a bit more sensible, like, Mitt Romney-ish type style Republicans who, like, you know, hark back to the to the old days of 2012, right? So we think that because there is relatively divided messaging among the Republicans, if you can have that uh, divided messaging, if you can have those uh, incumbency bonuses to Kamala Harris, uh, that allows you to win the election fairly easily. Yes, Shark, go ahead. Got yeah, that. That, 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 as far as I know, it's very rare for President to step down in the middle of his term. What would people think and how would the media spin this, given all the speculation about the team and about Biden himself? Just like, I, I, I imagine he just like come out and say all of the things like, we think Kamala Harris is a really good candidate, I'm getting old, I want to hang out with my dog, etc. <laughs> okay, thanks for my support at the start. So, second thing I want to talk about then, having moved on from incumbency, is why Kamala Harris in and of herself is just a popular char um, character. And there's a couple of things to talk about here. Firstly, Kamala Harris is just fairly moderate in a similar way to how Joe Biden is, that just plays well with American voters, she appeals to a relatively wide base um, you know, across America. But on top of that, she also provides a bit of a grand historical narrative, right? People like to get on board and they get enthusiastic with an election which is a first. And having the first woman of colour be president and having the uh, having her be the first one to be elected gives her that grand historical narrative and gets her a lot of grandeur that people are likely to get around. But on top of that, she's been associated with a person that people mostly like in the form of Joe Biden, but also she just comes from California. It's a very big state. She's got a lot, a lot of momentum from there. Lots of people support her. But also, she has very low baggage, right? The critiques generally that have come across Kamala Harris tend to be critiques that have come from the far left about her, her, her trip, like what she did when she was Attorney General in California. But there's actually very little about Kamala Harris that is dislikable on the right. Most of the things that she did and most of the critiques that came from the far left during the, uh, during the uh, primaries uh, in, in 2020 or 2019 or whatever year, most of those critiques actually just make her look fine and sensible for moderates, for example, being tough on crime, etc. So there really isn't a lot there, as opposed to like Biden has, you know, going to strong terms general, etc. those sorts of things, oh, yeah. making it look kind of bad. No thank you, Shadoka. Last thing I want to talk about is that you avoid Republican talking points. And basically what I, what I want to say here is that on the basis of the fact that the Democrat Party has a very wide scope of people that come under the umbrella of that party, it is just incumbent always on Democratic leaders within the party to talk about things like race and gender. And what you end up with when you have white candidates having to talk about race and gender is very clumsy moments. So for example, Joe Biden just like promising to put a black woman on the Supreme Court. For example, Hillary Clinton carrying hot sauce around in her bag. Those are the sorts of things that are very bad for a couple of reasons. 
The first is that for minority voters within the Democrat Party who actually just want to hear about, like, actually just want to hear about, like, environmental or economic policy or whatever, every time the white Democratic leader goes down to the southern border, all they talk about is immigration and the wall and those sorts of things. So we think, every, so, uh, so we think it's better for, um, for Kamala Harris in that way. And the main reason why is just, like, if you think back to the Obama presidency, just by the fact that Obama was himself from a minority group just meant that he didn't have to make silly promises like, I'm going to put a black person on the Supreme Court, because he just embodies the fact that, that, that they were making strides towards that. But that's really important in another way, which is just sort of becomes spotted for the culture war when people make really silly calls like that and look clumsy on TV. It makes it look uh, to, to like white voters and Republican voters, like all they care about, uh, you know, like gimmicky, uh, you know, gimmicky woke policies, they get carried by Fox News, carried on, turned into fodder, that makes you unelectable if you can be made to look like that's all you care about. If you spend your time talking about policy, talking about economics, etc., it's more likely that you're going to appeal, therefore, to the white moderates and the white Republicans. Last thing I want to say here is just a comment on the long-term future of the, of the Democrat Party. And the thing about Joe Biden is he's very, very establishment, but he's establishment particularly in the fact that he's attached to the old ways of doing government. And that was part of the reason why he was, uh, part of the reason why he was elected, and that's part of his appeal, but actually we think it's bad in the long term. Joe Biden is unlikely to be the president that admits DC and Puerto Rico as states in the United States. He's unlikely to be the president that gets rid of the filibuster. But those are things that for the good of America we ought to do just for the sake of democracy, allowing people to be represented within that democracy. But also they're things that are good for the Democrats because those would become Democrat Senate, Democrat Senate would disempower the Republican advantage in the Senate so it's good for the Democrat Party. <laughs> long-term health, 
most of the analysis that comes out about comma being uh, likable is analysis that we can carry to our side of the house. Uh-huh. What they have to prove in this debate is why she can't win if Biden just decides not to run in 2024. They get very little comparative analysis here. We're going to tell you exactly why it is that stepping down midterm uniquely creates uh, the seeds of division in the Democratic Party that is so bad for anyone's electability. Why does this reopen left liberal divide? Democrats lost to Trump in 2016 because they didn't have any internal coherency. Biden resolved that divide by creating a coalition that accepted his presidency. Sure, people might have wanted uh, Bernie more, but the acceptance from the majority that was so scarred by the disunity that led to everything happened, uh, that happened after 2016 is the reason why such a broad coalition came out to support Biden's presidency. Note though that there is still a small and vocal passionate minority that hates Biden and will capitalize on him stepping down for their own interests to make the Democratic Party more socialist than they can be realistically in the political framework of America. Why is this the case? Firstly, it shows that either Biden or his team has no faith in the broad coalition that he has led to win the election again. It suggests that he doesn't want to capitalize on the large amount of voters that voted him into power. Secondly, it's a political opening, right? As soon as you have someone who is the acting president and not the president themselves, that gives socialists the ability to say, maybe AOC or someone from the squad should run against this person in the future election because they're not the real president. They don't have that legitimacy behind them in the same way they would on our side of the house. The third thing to say, though, is that from the outside, it looks like the Democrats are in fighting again because the airtime revolves around resolving this clash, figuring out why it was that this president with such a broad coalition decided that he had to step down? Is there some reason that he felt that his party would not be able to win again? Did he not trust in this uh, Kamala's ability to win an election in 2024? We think this means that people focus more on resolving that clash instead of rallying for Democrats. The fourth thing to say, though, is that the capital that is involved in rallying for individual candidates and then trying to resolve that around Kamala in 2024 is far more than just rallying for the Democrats writ large. We don't even give you the opportunity to try and stand another candidate against Kamala when she runs in 2024 because her media narrative is never overshadowed by the decisions that Biden made when he stepped down. Fifthly, we tell you that incumbency bias and that strong force means that the status quo discussion is about what the Democratic Democrats are doing in 2024, not which individual candidates are running in 2024. That's really good. Let's impact this material. Firstly, disunity in the Democratic Party makes 2020 far harder than it needs to be. Finally, note that empowering this faction doesn't actually get you the kinds of policy change they want on their side of the House because it's who that policy is associated with. So Biden can pass the most, like, expansive American Indian policy through budget reconciliation. AOC probably can't even if it's the same policy. So we, we think in terms of how that narrative is pushed, it needs to be through a candidate like Biden under 2024. How does the media respond to midterm step down? And note that this exclusively proves why they can't claim any of their benefits in this debate. Firstly, presidents don't normally step down midterm unless there's a huge scandal, right? There's no reason for someone to step down mid-presidency, mid-presidency. So even if they're like, oh, Biden will just say he feels old and wants to play with his dogs, the media starts to speculate, right? They already think he's Swiss cheese brain. They'll be like, the man's got fucking dementia. Let's kick him out. The Democrats don't know who to call us behind. Importantly note that this overtakes the news cycle, right? In the same way that the National Party leadership changes meant that no one knew what the fuck the National Party stood for. You don't get discussion about the expansive policy changes that Biden pushes through. You only get discussion about who the new leader is going to be. We think that's really harmful. The third thing to say, though, is that you you give water to the people who speculate about things like Biden's mental health. That's really bad. It doesn't matter when it happens, right? But because even if he steps down right after the mid-elections, it still comes back at election time. You you crowd out candidates and their ability to talk about policy because Fox News and CNN are busy asking Kamala, well, why actually did Biden step down? We don't really care what your policies on race are. We want to know why this historic event happened. The second thing to say, though, is that it disconnects successors, i.e. Kamala, from Biden's platform because people disconnect her from Biden's COVID relief plan because they've forgotten that that plan even happened. They're busy talking about why he stepped down. Note that in the swing states like Florida, they were most assisted by these relief plans. That's exactly where we want discussion about policy happening, not speculation in the media. 
Finally, why this delegitimizes the Democratic Party? People voted by and why? And, and most importantly, that this is people like respectability voters who, who feel betrayed by the fact that they went against their party allegiance to vote in a president that has now stepped down and betrayed them. We think you lose those kind of Republican legitimacy voters, but you also get a sense of betrayal from people on the left. Note that the harm of this in this debate is that the incentive to turn out and vote in elections decreases at the point where you feel like your voice is no longer being heard. And turnout matters in this debate because 10,000 votes spread across swing districts can decide who wins and loses the 2024 election. But the second thing to say here is that we are also the side that upholds faith in democracy, which is currently at an all-time low in America as backslide continues to happen. You are more likely to accept backslide on their side of the house. Things like court stacking after 2022, if you think that your vote doesn't matter, we think that's incredibly dangerous. I think the final thing to say, though, is that lots of this is based on norms and on legality anyway. At the point where a norm exists that presidents see out their turn, shifting that changes the calculus from any possible policy discussion. It's unclear how they get elections that are winnable on their side. Now listen, Jack, here's the deal. The main issue I actually have with what we've heard from Hunger is essentially, well, there's two problems. We'll bring this out fully in the speech. But we just don't believe that voters actually care about the kinds of norms of serving out a full term in office that Umber claims exist. But more generally, we think even if this norm is something that voters care a lot about, the general norm is that you fill out your term in office and run for re-election. And so their characterization of voter behavior is one that is hugely marginal, right? That the world is going to come crashing down on the Democratic Party if Joe Biden says, I am ill, I can't hold up responsibilities of office, this great vice president is taking over. But there are no equal harms if he goes, I am ill, the presidency is tough for me, that's why I won't do it for another four years, but I'm gonna stay around as a sort of not particularly competent person for two more, and there'll be an open primary after the fact, right? Their characterization didn't really make up much of sense on their own sort of view of what norms we actually care about in politics, but also just more broadly, we don't think it engages the action material that we were able to unify the party through the unique benefits of incumbency. So that's the main sort of through line that's running through the rest of my speech. How am I going to divide it up? We'll start with this thing about just general media response, then we'll talk about disunity on the left liberal base within the Democratic Party, and lastly we'll tie all that together with sort of more extraneous additional material about who wins in twenty twenty. Firstly, about the media response, right? The main real thrust and probably the main addition, additional mechanism we got from the negation team was to say that there will be a huge deal of speculation at the point where Joe Biden announces he is stepping down. It's going to create a cloud over public Harris coming into office, and it's going to cause a whole bunch of questions about the competency of Biden and whether the Democrats are ruling off the party, particularly fit for government. The thing is, right, this was basically just predicated on the assertion of a norm that presidents should always serve out a whole term in office, and the assertion that it's going to be particularly bad because presidents don't normally step down midterm. Sure, presidents historically haven't, but presidents also historically haven't been fucking 80 years old, right? We think we're probably a little bit outside the normal norms of office. The last four years might also attest to that, and voters are a little bit more willing to see norms bent ever so slightly to the margins if they give them a better quality of their body politic. 
right? What do you think actually happens at the point at which Joe Biden says it? He probably says, I am 80 years old. This is a particularly difficult job. It's one I don't feel I'm any more qualified to hold. That's why I'm passing it over to my incredibly qualified vice president who has been doing good things and has two years experience in office. We also think just more generally, we got these ideas of broad speculation about what this meant about Biden's mental state, right? We think if there is speculation about what Biden's mental state was like at the time before he resigned, it doesn't matter because he's not president anymore, right? The crucial mechanism we gave you is that an octogenarian <coughs> with memory issues isn't a news story unless they have the nuclear codes. And that literally goes away at the point to which he stepped down from office, right? We, we think that the more likely response to Biden announcing he's stepping down for health reasons is probably akin to Todd Muller announcing he was resigning for mental health reasons, an outpouring of sympathy for a person in public service who is broadly quite popular, who just has the courage to say they can no longer hack it in this job and are taking a step to like, just protect themselves, right? We just don't think it's particularly true. We think at the margins, maybe InfoWars says that Biden was dead for years or something weird, but it probably won't actually affect the behavior or opinions of most ordinary voters, that is an incredibly weird mechanism. Also, just like, we do have some, like, I, I, I don't want to make it too example heavy, right? But we do have governors, which are like mini presidents of state, that resign all the time midterm for any fucking reason, and it doesn't generally affect the past and lean, right? Sarah Palin in Alaska literally said she was bored of being governor and wanted to go beyond reality TV, and didn't affect the quality of the Republican Party, because they just, we just push back against the existence of a norm serving out a term in office, it was made up, it doesn't exist, and even if it does, the norms are willing to be bent at the point to which, um, at the point to which you have an eight-year-old president who is in of itself defining the norm. Also, more strategically, no response to our material that has the bigger harm from media coverage is letting Biden stay in office and watching him slowly decline as the toll of the most difficult job in Earth on Earth it takes its effect on an eight-year-old person who already has, like, through no fault of his own, difficulties to communicate. We think there was a real, real risk in no response to Penance material about the next time he falls down the stairs and he gets more injured, the next time he has to go in unplanned surgery, the worse it is for the party. Because the worst thing for a politician's popularity, particularly a commander in chief, is if they appear weak. Just no response to that. We think the media environment is far, far worse than their world, where Joe Biden is clearly not up to the job, seems to hold that job. Conversely, we get sort of the broad, redemptive glow of the arc of a person stepping down while they still have the capacity to do so, rather than leaving the white house either through the ballot box or like literally feet first right we'll take that for your life so would it be worse if in, in the status quo you can obviously spin media around by being fine even if he's not fine but don't you confirm the fact that he might have not been fine while he was president if he suddenly steps down we think you can spin it for now but the point you made is it's probably going to get more and more difficult to spin the closer you get to the upcoming election and it's probably much much worse like even in their world where joe biden says i'm not running again this is a world where now Kamala Harris is running for the nomination as the incumbent vice president. And there are huge questions about, is your president fit for office? Why isn't he running for another term? Why does he still have the nuclear codes, right? The narrative is much, much worse on their world, even if you buy their characterization of what voters genuinely care about. Okay, next point. Disunity on like a left liberal schism within the Democratic Party. Because this was the other quite important mechanism. And we think it ties quite well into what we were saying. A really, really crucial way that the Democrats can win in 2024 is if they look like a unified party that can all sort of row together, like the like the National Party vote and that John Key and person a few years ago. Right? <laughs> so at the point to which that's sort of the main characterization, they're able to win the election by appealing to a unified party base, especially when the Republicans are disunified, that takes a lot of weight. Do you know what really causes a lot of disunity to a political party? an open race for the presidency where anyone can step in like the last open race for the presidency where 25 people ran with 25 different arguments about why all the other 24 people would be the worst president ever and they would be great right we think it's, it's just it's objectively so true that there is no way to like better way to guarantee unity within a political party than having a primary in which there is an incumbent president who steamrolls all opposition why is that because everyone, even the ones who do have ideological gripes with the current president, know they can't win, so they wait for the next election and they've got a better shot, right? Like, there was left-wing disdain for, like, the Bernie Sanders wing for the Democratic Party throughout the Obama years, but they waited until Obama wasn't running in a primary to actually expose that schism to the wider media because they knew they couldn't win until there was an open seat. So this is a world where an incredibly vulnerable Vice President Kamala Harris, who doesn't have the benefits, that we would put to be a unique benefit of the awesome power of the presidency and is able to actually win that primary far more easily. So we give you that like, quite clear mechanism as to why that is the case. The sort of 
um, dissent is minimized until later in the game when the people who have that dissent have got a chance to actually win in the primary, which is their world where the primary is over and there's no incumbent president. And also, like people who are moderate or on the fence about Kamala Harris can now be won over to her by her ability to pass transformative moves that only the president can do. Like Penno said, like eliminate his true debt to the stroke of a pen by executive order. By literally just having the ability to control the media narrative from the bully pup pulpit that only a president gets. We think it was a really, really weird characterization that just didn't make a lot of sense to say that you're only going to get disunity at the point which there's an incumbent president who is going to clearly win that primary and win it by like 90 to 95 percent in the same way every incumbent president has in any primary going back all the way to the beginning of the party system. So that's the clearest way you get this kind of unity. Um, and also, you just literally write, she's a new president. She gets that honeymoon period. She comes in, she's historic. People get to the most days to want to cement that historical narrative. We think this with a more fractured party, this with a more fractured media environment. We get sympathy for Biden, who's now gone. We welcome in the new crowd to propose. <laughs> So you haven't proven that she's going to win the nomination, so you can't claim half my speech. All right, <laughs> let's, 
talk about the nomination, right? Because the nomination itself, all the benefits of Kamala Harris has been very good at being able to you know, explain race issues, but also being modern and therefore liked by a lot of people, is unique. It is not unique in the sense that that means she would also do well in the nomination. It's not tied to an incumbency. The second point there, though, is that they assume that the incumbency benefit comes from just being president. That's not true, right? It comes from being voted in as president. That you've gone through the electoral cycle, that you've done the whole campaigning, and that people have voted for you specifically. That is not going to be the case now, right? Because that Kamala Harris never went through that. So this is going to be like Biden going through that himself as he had to after he was vice president for Obama. It's not like just because Biden happened to be president because Obama stopped uh, being president, that he would have any of those benefits at all. In fact, it's going to be the opposite, as I'm going to explain to you, because of the media spin on it from the Republicans, because of the media spin on it in general, but also about the disunification in that. So, you know, the, the example here would, would, would be that she doesn't get any benefit of just being president if that wasn't presidency, if that wasn't an earned presidency by being voted in. So therefore, it's likely on their side, she still faces the same amount of pressure by having a lot of other people competing against her as on our side, but we say it's actually worse on their side for all the analysis that Umber gave you in that the people who voted for Biden as a compromise now feel betrayed, right? Because Biden was no longer there in heart with presidency. It was Kamala Harris who said something, some people that they don't like as well, but also it broke that kind of pact between the left and the liberals in the Democratic Party, which means you get that resurgence of a disunity where people start running because they think they were betrayed by that the compromise they made, and therefore you get far less likely, far less likely on their side to come out and win the nomination. Let's talk about this norm, right? This norm actually doesn't make any sense because, sure, first of all, let's talk about what happens when he's a president and stepping down, right? So if he steps down at the end of his presidency, he can say, I'm stepping down because I don't want to do it anymore. And that should be more normal than if he stops immediately, suddenly in the middle of his presidency. Because that seems urgent, right? As opposed to being like, yeah, I'm going to hand it over. Kamala, you go uh, do the campaigning and I'll hand over power if you win the election. That's not as urgent, right? So the speculation then of why he's doing that isn't based on that urgency. When he immediately stops and has to literally give over power to the vice president, people are going to ask why. And it's not that, oh, now he's suddenly got mental health then he stopped, he no longer has the nuclear code, it's that you lied to us in the previous election. He was always having mental health problems, and you lied to us and let him do this, and he was, what if he didn't catch him so soon? He could have literally nuked the world. That's the media's been, that's what they let that speculation get to on the other side of the house. Um, so that's why as well, the difference in the 2024 stepping down is the key thing that wins us this debate. This it's not about a governor retiring. Nobody gives a shit about a governor. This is the president. For all the reasons of the history of, uh, of, of how Biden's narrative worked in the, uh, in, the, in the election prior, this is far more inflammatory because of the mental health claims that were made in the past. Now, let's talk about Biden declining in age, right? Well, we don't think Biden's going to decline in age so far in the two years into 2024, but if that's something they're worried about, we can always spin narratives around that to make sure that doesn't come out. It's also not likely. There's a risk of doing that. But the moment that you suddenly step down, as I've already explained, you don't need it to be true, right? That media spin happens already. Conservatives talk about that. It's also more likely to be believed. Nobody cares about the truth anymore in politics, and people are more likely to believe that on the other house. Now, finally, let's talk about a unified party. No, thank you. We have already explained to you that there are significant harms from breaking that compromise that happened between the liberal and the le leftist elements of the Democratic Party. And the harm to this is not just that you will be attacked from the Democratic Party within during the nomination, uh, as they were worried about, probably flipping that argument on them, but it also means that if the, the, the difference actually works within the Democratic Party for the long term, right? Because that, that careful compromise that was made to beat Trump is now less likely to be made the second time because of the 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 the, 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 the perception that Biden, who is being president, is being the president, was a lie that he was always going to give power off to Kamala, or that he was always mentally ill, and you lied to us about that, means that the relatively radical left within the party are more likely to spin against the other, other people nominated, but also reduce and repress turnout in the nominations itself, itself, which means Kamala is less likely to win on their side, but also which means the whatever happens in the nomination process carries on to the actual election process, which means even if Kamala gets nominated on their side, but all the analysis that Umba showed you already, applies to the election itself, which means you might end up having a Trump presidency on the other side. If this debate was about actually winning the presidency in 2024, they've done a
very, very bad job of explaining why why you should step down now, as opposed to why you're far, far more secure in getting Kamala Harris in power in 2024 on our, our side of house side of side later. <laughs> Alternative, like harmful narratives that can, can uh, exist 
uh, even if it is considered bad to drive on your step down. Well, first you have the fact that there's going to be a primary because there's going to be other people contesting the race. I'll talk more about this later. But when there's other people contesting the race, you now have the narrative of disunity in the Democrats. Yeah. Different people attack each other on who should lead the Democratic Party and run. Yeah. So you create a narrative of disunity at a time when you want to compete the Republican Party, which in their world could be united around Trump, or could, more predictably, be through determining whether it should be Trumpism or non-Trumpism, right? Uh, but you also have the narrative that <coughs> Biden was sick, he knew he was, but he didn't yeah. do anything about it, and Kamala went along with that. She exposed the American people to risk when she should have been the one to step up. That's an incredibly harmful narrative the media will spin about her. You can bet by God Fox News would spin that. That's a narrative they didn't deal with. Okay, why is it easier for her to win then? All right. Oh, and just note on that. So they said, oh, if Biden sits down, it, it acknowledges that he's previously been sick and that looks bad. First, it's not tied to Pamela because she's actually stepping up and being the responsible person and taking up the role, yeah. right? But B, Biden would just frame it as, I'm not dying right now, but I'm making a responsible decision. It's easily possible to spin that. Okay. okay. Let's then talk about why it's easier for her to win. And first thing here, they haven't proved why she would win the nomination. Why haven't they proved that? Because they just asserted why that, that she will, because they said she's popular for all the reasons we said. But no, our reasons were contingent on the fact that she's tied with those incumbency benefits. She has the airtime of being the president. She's seen as making presidential decisions. She's seen as one of someone who's implementing life-changing policy for yeah. millions of Americans, right? In the alternative world, the people who are critical of her, who would otherwise be afraid to run against her because they know of the power of the incumbency and the power of policy decisions to appeal to voters, would run against her. You would get people coming out of the woodwork, Elizabeth Warren, people who want to challenge her on far-left issues, and people that perceive they are more conservative towards her. Even if you only had one or two, they can launch sophisticated attacks on her. But not B, she might not have a strong team with her, because people that Biden yeah. is united in his team might go to their preferred candidates in primary elections and break up Biden's unifying force, because they believe the other person is better than her, right? So that means you have a contested nomination, which you literally might lose until you get the beneficial candidate oh, they yeah. acknowledge that she has, yes. So you just said that Kamala stands behind the president and is credited with a lot of the policies that he proposes. Why doesn't that give her the incumbency benefits that you're talking about? Right, but the problem is, right, is that she's not the president. She's not on her own. She's tied to the fact that Joe supported her and Joe stood by her. And then when Joe steps down as perceived to have been weak, whereas retrospectively, she doesn't get that benefit. She's someone who was united with an ailing president, not a successful one. In a world in which she becomes the president, she takes on those benefits and graduates to being the leader of the nation. That's what gives her that power. So in their world, she doesn't necessarily win the nomination. Even if she does, you've now got a disunity, a democratic party that is perceived to be weak, while the Republican will have sorted themselves. Why does she then, right, uh, win when she is incumbent? First, because of all the reasons they didn't sufficiently respond to, which is if you're president, you have sufficient airtime, you control the media narrative, you can choose when to appear, what issues to talk about, you can literally sign policy that changes millions of lives overnight. That's massive. They didn't respond to that fact. They didn't respond to the fact that they should she can like literally just have name recognition and knowledge and be perceived to be the leader of the nation. It's incredibly important. Those massive incumbency benefits let her win the primary nomination. Because people don't want to challenge her, they're afraid. And because parties' own rules allow them not to have primary nominations when they have an incumbent president and in leadership. So she takes on that role. And then she wins the election, right? Because she's had those years of making changes. She is that great candidate that she accepted, that they accepted she was, right? So she's able to win and dominate the political scene and she's able to challenge others, right? Particularly, no stars pivot to, oh, Trump's going to run, what's she going to do about that? Well, she's not Joe Biden, who QAnon people think stole the election, right? She's a new and independent candidate. But also, she's, in comparison to Trump, all those things we talked about, she doesn't have baggage, she's respectable, she's liked by both white and, and, and minority voters, so she has that power to win the election, which they have accepted she's the best candidate. So, in the end, you have to ask yourself, is the media narrative so bad that it outweighs all incumbency benefits that she will have? And is she so guaranteed to win the nomination as a vice president, which does not always occur, that it is not a good thing for Biden to let her graduate to the leader of the nation and naturally assume the mantle of the next president? <laughs>
today was never about the unity of the candidates. It was about the relative risk that that candidate took on when they firstly went through the primary and secondly went to the election. It was about the stability and of the unity of the base. And what we told you is that when Joe Biden steps down prematurely, you open up a gap for that very vocal minority of left-wing voters that had an incentive to destabilize the Democratic Party to get what they want, to insert that agenda back into the primary. Even if Kamala wins the primaries, she carries that baggage, she carries that instability through to the election, and she is, uh, that she is at risk to a higher degree on their side of the house of losing that election because she has turned off the, the left wing who has grown bigger and she has also turned off the respectability Republicans who voted for Biden and were reassured that he was going to bring back respectability politics and were betrayed when it happened all again. That's how we win this debate. I'll firstly deal with how media uh, address this issue, then flow on to how that affects the narrative. Then I'll uh, basically relitigate that material about why the left creates instability and that means that the risk is just not worth taking on their side of the house uh, and how that reduces the ability of them to win, right? Let's talk about the media. They have way too much faith in news media, right? It's not the same as New Zealand. You simply cannot analogize. There is far more hatred. There is far more partisanship. They will not be sympathetic to Joe Biden because they have a political incentive to undermine him. That is for every Republican owns news media institutions that want him to lose, right? They have a profit incentive to make the most speculative stories they possibly can because that's the kind of stuff that people click on and they literally just don't have any morals in the US. Like news standards are out the door. You wouldn't have fucked you want over there, right? Here they tries to say, well, even if this news like coverage happens, it's, you can't have one to two years of cap coverage. That's ridiculous. They clearly don't understand how the American politics like cycle works, right? Like there's massive political analysis that happens at every step of the campaign. When you go to the primaries and then when you move forward to the election, everything that has happened over that cycle is relitigated in the news, right? And they bring it back up each time there's another stage and a step towards the election. It comes back every time, right? But even if it, uh, it only happens at the very outset when he sits down, that remains in the minds of voters. They think that he was weak. They think that he passed the, the torch over to Kamala simply because he couldn't hack it, not because Kamala was the natural progression of the next candidate, right? They then tell us that voters don't care about norms of staying in office, and this was like almost all of like Karen's like gotcha material, right? They care about the norm of him staying in office because they voted him in, and they expect him to have the democratic mandate to run the country. They did not vote in Kamala Harris, so therefore they get upset when he randomly abdicates in the middle of his term and gives it to Kamala Harris. The reason why that doesn't happen on our side of the house is because he finishes his term, Kamala goes through the normal democratic process, processes of being elected as a candidate and winning the election, and voters feel like their democratic voice has been heard and been put into that candidate. They do not feel like that on their side of the house, right? Then we tell you uh, <laughs> that... I'll finish that point. But at, at the end of that point, what does that mean? It means that you're likely to have the media crack down on Kamala and crack down on Biden and take them out to like not know what they're doing, for the, for the for Biden to be unstable, for it all to have been a massive mistake to elect Biden in the first place. What does that mean for the narrative then? They tell us that Kamala is ready to step up and he's standing by Biden, but then they also want to contradictorily say that she can't claim any of the policy like benefits of the policy that passes through while she's standing by her, that's clearly inconsistent, right? She does get the policy. But the problem is I can't get the benefit of the policy being attributed to her because the way that Biden unified the size of the Democratic Party and pulled in those respectability uh, voters is, is why he's the unique reason which he can pass progressive policy. When people like look up there and see the imaging of a woman of colour passing really, really radical policy, that is going to be far more divisive than the respectability Biden passing that policy. She is probably less likely to get that policy passed. She cannot accrue those benefits. She is more likely to accrue them when she is able to stand by Biden and basically like you know get them by absorbing. She does not get the incumbency uh, a benefit on their side of the house because she's not voted in. People feel betrayed. They like they didn't vote for her to be the president. But the name recognition mechanisms they talk about are completely symmetrical on our side of the house because she's still the VP. She still does all the interviews. Everyone still knows who she is. So to the extent that there is an incumbency bias, it's symmetrical, right? Then in terms of uh, 
Will she win the nominations and what happens in terms of the left trading and stability? We tell you that on our side of the house, the gap does not open, right? It's only that, uh, and in the worst case, like at best it is, oh, so, 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 so care for us to say that we won't win nominations, right? And they say that the only reason that like we won't win women on um, nominations because they have incompetency bias and we don't, which I've just proved. But even if it was true, it would just be easier on their side. I think there's no analysis for why Kamala would actually lose the nomination on our side, right? So then it comes down to the question of when you go through this messy uh, primary process, what happens to the reputation of Kamala and how does that create a, a, a sense of democratic instability? It means it's very hard for her to win the election, even if she gets over all of the meddling of the left and actually manages to win the primary. Why does the gap open for like left-wing people to come in and, and meddle again? Biden hasn't died, right? He's still there. There's no real reason for him to step down. For him to step down in the middle of a term would have to be very compelling because it literally goes against the democratic mandate for him to be president. So it's not really enough of an explanation to say, oh, I was just feeling a bit tired. Like maybe that works for Todd Muller, but it's a very different system here, right? There's like 50 states we all care about a lot more people, right? <laughs> Where there are a little bit more men, right? So that means that the, the gap opens because it seems like Biden steps down for an illegitimate reason. And there's so much Biden hate that's been quietly suppressed in this small minority because they basically just took the long and short of it to, to be able to get more stability. But when they see there is an opportunity to put their foot in the door, to put AOC into the primaries, to put their radical candidate into the primaries, they will do so, right? The team is over and, and the kind of like club hating effect of the Kamala Biden team creating unity between the, the left and the liberals is over. She's not seen as an incumbent president, she's seen as holding the fort, she has no democratic mandate. That means you not only get pressure from the left, you also got get pressure from the respectable politics people, the people who really like Biden. They will probably run another pale stale white guy because that's the kind of people a lot of people in the US like. That means Kamala has pressure from both sides of the board because she doesn't really have the legitimacy of being the real president. People with the real president back, so they just take Biden 2.0, I don't know, maybe Pete Buttigieg gets like shoved in there for another try, and you still have like far more chaos going on in that situation. Why is that harmful, right? Because it removes the legitimacy that would happen if there was a simple, clean, natural progression from Biden, like not running in the midterms and saying, I'm handing over to Kamala in the midterms, in the, oh no, sorry, not in the midterms, in the primaries, in a way that is understood by the American people, in a way that follows democratic norms, in a way that makes them feel like it's acceptable that Kamala is basically inheriting the throne of Biden, right? That's why it's more important in this debate that we take the class, uh, uh, the timing of the negating team and not the timing of the affirmative team, right? It was a careful compromise for Biden to beat Trump and that is undermined when people are betrayed. People don't like necessarily love Kamala. A messy nomination harms the presidency rates from both sides of the political spectrum. We're very proud to have stability in the US. <laughs> Why is Kamala undeterred on our side of the house? 
She gets the incumbency benefits and policy spreads already as vice president, right? She's always drinking in Biden in the photos he posts on Twitter. She's always in the interviews where she talks about the radical COVID relief bill that Biden is able to pass. But importantly, she gets the benefit of Biden having the mana to pass that stuff really easy without her having to go out as a woman of color and try to get the Senate on side with her. Note, however, the clear assumption of Biden completing a successful term with Kamala Harris and then stepping down is that he has confidence in her to carry on his legacy. What do we outline? And I want to be really clear here that from first, we've explained exactly how people respond to a sudden step down by Biden. The first thing to say is that there are questions about why Biden had to step down now. Did he not have confidence in his team to carry out the work that was required to, to lead the US uh, through, through the rest of his term. Secondly, though, it's the base stepping up to say that maybe another candidate might now have a chance because Kamala didn't have the trust of Biden to, for him to seek out his term. She needed to become incumbent president for her to have a chance to win. Two things happen as a result, right? Firstly, more people run because they think there is an opportunity from them. The people in the base who wanted Bernie to be president last time now try to put up someone like AOC because they think there is a chance, there is division in terms of how people see this response. But secondly, the voter coalition that Biden painstakingly formed is divided. They feel betrayed by the fact that he stepped down after they voted him in to be the candidate that, that helped unite America. I think that is radically unresponded to by the Bernie team. Secondly, let's just look at media spin because I wish US media was as unbiased and accurate and unspeculative as affirming thought. Not only would they speculate on why he dropped out, they would bring it up every time the election was mentioned, right? And they claim that this news cycle just burns out. But in our lifetime, has the president ever stepped down midterm without any scandal being the reason? No, right? This is a huge departure from the norm. No one gives a shit about Sarah Palin outside of Alaska, but Biden is everyone's president. We think that impacts them. Why does this spin comparatively not occur on our side of the house? I think the first thing to note is that there is just a general expectation that he is a one-term president. But note that for an 80-year-old to step down after a term is actually not as strange or as sharp says, urgent, right? Their analysis only applies in the unlikely event that Biden becomes visibly decrepit in the next three years. I think the timing of when he announces that he foresees himself becoming incapable matters. Because when it happens midterm, he's like, oh no, I think the next year I might become decrepit. Of course you're gonna think he's already Swiss cheese brain, right? In comparison, if he fills out his term, it is legitimate that that might be a foreseeable harm, that he has pushed himself to his limit, and he thinks it's possible he won't make it four years rather than just one year. The media narrative is that he finished the term, not that he was so sick or unconfident that he dropped out halfway. We don't let the media focus on anything but the policy that Harris passed. She's far more likely to win the presidency in 2024. <laughs>
They don't respond to the fact that the narrative is worse on our side. Because the narrative becomes, why did Joe Biden, with his Swiss cheese brain, quote unquote, not trust you to run the country? Why did he continue on because he did not believe that you were going to be able to take America forward? And the problem with that narrative, relative to the narrative proposed by the negating team, is that as soon as Joe Biden moves on, that's the end of the story. And yes, there might be a tale of speculation afterwards, and ongoing op yes that mean that it's in the discourse for at least a while, but every single time on our side, when Joe Joe Biden makes a slip up. Every single time when Joe Biden does something wrong and he's announced that he's not going to run again, that's an ongoing harm to the credibility of Kamala Harris. On top of that, we get assertion from the negation team that there is enormous stain in the presidency. But we explain that the whole point of having a vice president is in case someone needs to step down. But we also know that just like example-wise, at the governor level, it's absolutely not, absolutely not true. But even if we're just like accepting norms that are entirely asserted and debating now, if that's a legitimate tactic, it could also be true that there's a huge norm that like no one has ever chosen not to run again since the 1800s. Something terrible has gone wrong. The scandal in the Democratic Party. Kamala Harris is involved in some shady shit, and that's required Joe, Joe Biden to step down and allow Kamala Harris to get through. If we're asserting norms, we can do it too. They didn't analyze it. So at the back end of that, we also explain that we are the side that gets Kamala Harris nominated on the basis of incumbency. We are assertion that it is symmetrical, but that's not true. It is obviously the case that the President of the United States Probably the most famous person in the world has a greater degree of name recognition and a greater degree of display on the media and has a greater degree of association with the policies of the United States of America than the Vice President does, who probably realistically is comparable at best with a high profile senator such as those that will run in the nominations. But the other thing that we don't get responded to is that the Democratic Party might just not have any nomination at all because they simply don't have to when they have a sitting president It's in the rules. But the last thing I want to say here harks back to my first speech, and it's a discreet harm that says if you are avoiding the ongoing clumsiness of white people within the Democratic Party talking clumsily about race and gender, that is something that damages the party, even at the nomination level. So as soon as we have a nomination and continue to have the, like, the random white Democrats come out, you continue to damage the Democrats. That's important because we care about winning the election. We are the only side that proves a realistic pathway for Kamala to be nominated. They run the very real risk that someone else might be nominated, so are unable to co-opt their benefits, as I point out in a few why. But on top of that, we get the national incumbency benefits I discussed. But the last thing I just want to say is on the betraying the coalition thing. This only makes sense if you believe the norm that there is an expectation that Joe Biden doesn't stand down. But actually, the, no the, the coalition was never about Joe Biden. It was about Biden-Harris. It was about getting rid of Trump. We think we can stick with that. Thank <laughs> you.